Roughly a year and a half ago, I started a series where I would go through the many villain songs featured in Disney media starting from the early days. It didn't get that far because I realized I was more interested in the villainous characters themselves than just their songs. I'm going to attempt to do this again, but this time focusing on just that, the villains. It'll be an on and off again series I'll be doing here and there in addition to other videos. Our sympathy has always been with the heroes and their sidekicks. We want to see Cinderella escape her abusive family. We want to see the Dalmatian puppies avoid being killed. We want to see Ariel find love on dry land. And yet, while we want to see the good guys succeed, the villains often manage to be a little more interesting and engaging. They offer a dangerous walk on the wild side. There's so much to say about them, and I can certainly blather on about them to my heart's content. I'm going to mostly limit myself to the villains found in the classic Disney animated films, but there will be some exceptions. Like this video, for example. For this first video, we are going to be going back to the beginning, before Walt Disney started making full-length films. In fact, we're going back to before it all started with a mouse, before Mickey, before Oswald, we are going all the way back to 1925 with one of the oldest Disney characters, Pete. Some of the earliest Disney cartoons were about a young girl named Alice. Loosely inspired by Alice in Wonderland, the cartoons featured a live-action girl wandering around an animated world, often accompanied by a cat named Julius. Pete first appeared as Bootleg Pete in the cartoon Alice Solves the Puzzle. Here he is a peg-legged bear who gets his name from smuggling whiskey in a pelican's mouth. However, the initial scene where he's seen with the illegal booze was cut in the US prints of the cartoon, so his name was largely meaningless. Bootleg Pete is a collector of rare crossword puzzles, gotta have a hobby besides bootlegging I suppose, and he spends most of his screen time menacing Alice for her apparently very rare puzzle before being defeated by Julius. Other Pete appearances in the Alice comedies included him as a racing competitor in Alice Wins the Derby, the name is kind of a spoiler, a bandit in Alice's Tin Pony, and a kidnapper in Alice on the Farm. One of the darkest Pete cartoons came out around this time. In 1926, Alice's mysterious mystery showed Pete and a little mouse henchman dressing in Klansman-like outfits, try not to think about it too hard, and kidnapping a bunch of school children portrayed as dogs. And what is the purpose of being an overly competent dog catcher? He's turning them all into sausages. I think this is what Upton Sinclair was trying to warn us about. Seriously, this cartoon is grim. We see a little dog plead for his life in a scene that goes on a bit too long, complete with a minister to read him his last rites. And that dog doesn't make it out either, they kill him. The crude early animation somehow makes the whole thing even more unsettling. Seeing Pete chased into the distance by the freed dogs at the end isn't quite as satisfying as it was probably meant to be. As you can see from these early shorts, Pete was very much the classic villain with the top hat and the twirling mustache. It's the kind of thing that's so endearingly hokey, you could see it as being some sort of retro throwback to classic silent films, but these legitimately were the classic silent films. I guess every cliché has to come from somewhere. After the Alice series concluded, Pete made the transition to the next series about Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Pete once again played the villain role here, still as a bear, without much deviation from the norm. When Mickey Mouse became the next headliner, Pete was changed from a bear to a cat, which of course is very natural. While Pete as a bear was always a little larger than characters like Alice, Julius, and Oswald, this cat Pete really dwarfed Mickey, which probably helped a lot to endear the mouse to the audience. Mickey was even more of an underdog this way, against a foe that was at least three times his size. In the first couple cartoons, while Pete did play a traditional villain at times, he also sometimes played a gruff authority figure. In the first released Mickey Mouse short, Steamboat Willie for example, Pete is nasty but doesn't do anything evil. He is just a captain who wants Mickey to do his job and not play around with the animals. For the most part, however, Pete was usually always playing the bad guy role to Mickey's hero. There are plenty of shorts from the 1930s where Pete is a pirate, a kidnapper, a bully, etc. Even in a Gulliver's Travels inspired short, Mickey fights a giant spider that bears a striking resemblance to Pete. Around this time, Pete received his first audible dialogue provided by Billy Bletcher, a rather small man with a very big voice. Bletcher would voice Pete until the early 60s. As the years went on, Pete lost his iconic peg leg as the animators had trouble remembering which foot it was on. Even in some of his earliest appearances, like in Steamboat Willie, he lacked the peg. A comic eventually revealed that any time you see him with two feet, one is actually prosthetic. In the 1940s, there was less emphasis on Mickey Mouse shorts, since Walt Disney had grown close to Mickey and didn't like to show the flawed side of the heroic mouse as much. As a result, Donald Duck and Goofy shorts rose in popularity. 
While Goofy didn't encounter Pete too often in his solo cartoons, Donald's tangles with the Brute became more commonplace. Sometimes Pete would be a traditional villain, but just as often he was again a bullying authority figure. Pete was absent for a good while from most of the 60s to 1983, where he appeared in Mickey's Christmas Carol as the Ghost of Christmas Future. He was voiced by Will Ryan here, and while his appearance is certainly a frightening one, he wasn't really acting as a villain. More like a ghost who wanted to give Scrooge an effective scare for the greater good. Will Ryan voiced Pete again in DuckTales, where Pete appeared as a recurring villain. However, he's only called Pete in one episode, and all other times is portrayed as a completely different villain, sometimes even appearing in the distant past and time travel episodes. There's never a moment where he and Scrooge recognize each other, so I'm guessing these are all just Pete's relatives or something. I guess crime just runs in the family in that universe. Pete appeared at his most intimidating and competent in the 1990 short The Prince and the Pauper, arguably one of the best Mickey Mouse cartoons. In the adaptation of the Mark Twain novel, Pete is the evil captain of the guards who uses the king's ill health as an excuse to assert his tyranny over the kingdom, along with a squadron of identical weasel guards. There will be much more about the weasels in future episodes. Previous versions of Pete were still quite evil and calculating, but there was always a thuggish quality about them, a sort of villain who had a sense of humor, albeit a sadistic one. This Pete is much colder and more calculating in nature, someone to really be feared. For this portrayal, Pete was voiced by Arthur Burghardt, who also voiced Pete in various video games from the 90s and early 2000s. In 1992, the Goof Troop show premiered, and Pete was voiced by Jim Cummings for the first time, with Mr. Cummings continuing to voice Pete to this day with a great deal of enthusiasm and fun. The cartoon showed Pete in a slightly different light. Rather than acting as a criminal, he was a family man. We met his wife Peg, his son PJ, and his daughter Pistol. Despite now being a husband and father, Pete was just as bad as ever here, shown to be emotionally abusive to his son, and a scheming snake in the grass to his neighbor Goofy. His own wife often seemed at her wit's end by his slimy antics, and their relationship was always on the rocks. It's no wonder that Peg and Pistol didn't appear in a Goofy movie. I'm guessing the divorce was one for the ages. Pete's appearance in a Goofy movie and its sequel, an extremely Goofy movie, are somewhat brief, but still very important thematically. Pete and Goofy represent polar opposites as parents. Goofy wishes his son Max would spend more time with him so they can bond as father and son, and is loving but somewhat passive. Pete forces PJ to spend time with him, but takes no real interest in PJ's feelings and rules him with fear. A Goofy movie always felt like a, something of a more serious take on Goof Troop, well, as serious as a movie with Bigfoot disco dancing can be, and showed Pete's abuse of PJ in a darker, more distressing light. The kid was never terribly happy in Goof Troop, and it's even more evident in the movies. At least he managed to escape in the sequel, and hopefully managed to live a normal life afterward. Honestly, PJ may be one of the saddest characters to ever appear in a Disney cartoon. Now back in the public eye, Pete continued to appear in productions frequently at this point, like as recurring crook in the Mickey Mouse Works series, and the House of Mouse's corrupt landlord, who pretty much wanted to shut down the popular club for evil's sake. I guess his and Mickey's feud really does go back quite a while. In Mickey, Donald, and Goofy, The Three Musketeers, Pete was once again an evil captain of the guards who planned to usurp the throne. With his henchmen, the Beagle Boys, and for some reason Clarabelle Cow, he came perilously close to killing the three heroes. In more recent years, Pete has appeared on preschool shows like Mickey Mouse Clubhouse and Mickey and the Roaster Racers. In these shows, Pete has been toned down for small children in the audience, and is a silly prankster at worst, rather than a murderous criminal. With Pete's lengthy history, you might be surprised to find that his presence in the Disney theme parks is pretty minuscule. I've only been able to find two single pictures of costume Pete characters. One appears to be a backstage shot, and the other is from an ice show where Pete is in his Steamboat Willie outfit. Interestingly, he has a peg leg here, despite not having one in the cartoon. At Walt Disney World, the now-closed Mickey's Toontown Fair area had a building called Pete's Garage, but it was actually just a restroom with a nice facade. Now the area is Storybook Circus, which features Pete's Silly Sideshow, a tented area where guests can meet Donald, Daisy, Pluto, and Goofy. Pete only appears as a large plywood Barker figure. I was in the Disney College program as a character attendant myself around the time this area opened. The Barker is accompanied by a 20-minute loop of dialogue provided as always by Jim Cummings, and you'd better believe I had it memorized for quite a while. Pete has recently appeared inside an actual ride at Disney's Hollywood Studios. He can be seen in Mickey and Minnie's Runway Railway as a construction worker who clearly loves his job. One medium that Pete's done quite well in is video games. If there's a platformer that stars Mickey, Donald, or Goofy, Pete will be the final boss about 50% of the time. In the convoluted but enjoyable Kingdom Hearts series, he's Maleficent's main henchman in her world domination scheme. 
In the Epic Mickey series, there are several different versions of Pete all running around the wastelands. While it's possible for Mickey to befriend them, they are eventually revealed to be plotting something sinister amongst themselves, which was going to be the main plot of Epic Mickey 3 had it not been cancelled. However, the place where Pete has truly thrived the most has been the world of comics. Even when he stopped appearing in cartoons during the 70s, Pete has always been up to some of his worst tricks in the funny pages. One 1940s story arc even had him working as a Nazi spy. Just try to think about that the next time you catch the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. The comics also introduced Trudy Van Tubb, Pete's love interest and partner in crime. Unlike Peg from Goof Troop, who was attractive and looked vaguely human, Trudy was pretty much a girl version of Pete. She has yet to appear in animated form as of this video. Overall, I think the real strength of Pete's character is in how versatile he is, a trait he actually shares with Mickey. Mickey Mouse can either be an everyday guy just trying to get through life, or a globe-trotting adventurer, depending on the needs of the story. Likewise, Pete can be a bullying authority figure, a petty crook, or even the head of a crime syndicate. And yet, despite their different roles, we never doubt that they're still Mickey Mouse and Peg Leg Pete. That's the power of a great character, and knowing Pete, he'll never give up trying to get even with Mickey. Catnip While Pete went on to achieve greatness as a character, another one of Mickey's early foes fell into obscurity pretty quickly. Pete was a true threat to the well-being of Mickey and his friends, but it appears that Catnip was invented to be something of a smaller-scale hoodlum. His three anime appearances were all in 1929, as an assistant in the Opry House, a drunken hunter in When the Cat's Away, and as a barker in The Carnival Kid. In the Opry House, he wasn't evil or antagonistic at all. In When the Cat's Away, he's not much of a focus character. He's the cat who's going away, leaving his house to be swarmed by Mickey, Minnie, and a bunch of other mice, who for once are the proper size. In The Carnival Kid, he's a sleazy barker who does briefly antagonize Mickey a few times, although Mickey arguably started it by heckling him, and then keeping him awake by serenading Minnie. The only thing that truly qualifies Catnip as a real antagonist is his brief role in the comics. A 1931 story arc had Mickey and Catnip enter a battle of wits, where Mickey would continuously try to trespass on Catnip's land, and Catnip would tie knots in Mickey's tail each time he caught the mouse. While Catnip is portrayed as a no-good thug, it's still Mickey who initiates the conflict each time, making him no better in this one. Since then, Catnip has made a very small amount of appearances in the comics as a hoodlum or a petty criminal, even appearing alongside the Beagle Boys in prison once. But still, when you've got Pete and the Beagle Boys, why settle for the diet version? Beppo the Gorilla Beppo first appeared in a 1930 cartoon called The Gorilla Mystery, in which he, an escaped gorilla, breaks into Minnie's house and kidnaps her. Mickey, of course, saves the day. The cartoon is a little strange, it's not made entirely clear why this wild animal purposely invades Minnie's parlor and ties her up, but it's actually based on a dark comedy stage play called The Gorilla that had a similar plot. A film adaptation of the stage show had just come out at the time, so Disney must have decided it would make a fun idea for a cartoon. That might have been the end of Beppo were it not for King Kong making a huge impact on moviegoers in March of 1933. In June that year, Beppo returned as Congo the Killer in the cartoon Mickey's Mechanical Man. Beppo and a robot built by Mickey are opponents in a boxing match, with the robot of course coming out on top. Beppo's final appearance was later in 1933 in The Pet Store, where Mickey is put in charge of a pet shop that happens to sell gorillas. Beppo sees an ad for King Kong in a magazine and decides to imitate him, after all, monkey see, monkey do, causing a good deal of destruction in the process. Beppo seemed to get tamer in each appearance. In the Gorilla Mystery, he's a scary, bloodthirsty beast. In Mickey's Mechanical Man, he's violent, but his aggression is at least put to a somewhat practical use. In the Pet Store, he has a childlike innocence about him, even when causing mayhem as King Kong. In fact, the Pet Store is the only cartoon in which Beppo is named as such. The other two appearances seem to be retroactively stated to be the same gorilla. For whatever reason, Beppo did not appear after these three cartoons, but Donald and his nephews memorably fought a gorilla named Ajax in the appropriately titled Donald Duck and the Gorilla, nearly ten years later. The Mad Doctor Despite appearing only in a single cartoon, The Mad Doctor has made a big impression over the years. He first appeared in the 1933 cartoon of the same name, where the demented scientist kidnaps Pluto and plans to put the dog's head on a chicken to see what kind of eggs it will lay as a result. Note that his chalk drawing of a handsaw is dripping in blood. Mickey daringly journeys through the Doctor's haunted castle to save his dog, only to fall into the Doctor's wicked traps. 
It all turns out to be a nightmare, and everything is fine. The cartoon was one of Disney's spookier outputs, and was even banned in the UK and Germany upon its release. While it's pretty tame by today's standards, there is still at least one or two moments in a six and a half minute runtime that will probably give viewer shivers, even if they're playful ones. According to a sign on the door, the doctor's name is Dr. Triple X, but in every appearance after this, he's simply been known as the Mad Doctor, probably since Triple X has a different connotation now. He certainly lives up to his mad name, eager to pervert science for his own amusement, and delighting in torturing Pluto and Mickey. In this short, he was voiced by Billy Bletcher. Despite this being his only proper animated appearance, the Mad Doctor was featured in several video games following this. In Mickey Mania, he appears as a boss in the second level. When Mickey defeats him in some ports of the game, he regresses to a baby, kind of like in Don Bluth's Space Ace. His more substantial roles came in the Epic Mickey series. In the first game, he is an underling of the monstrous Shadow Lot, and is voiced by Dave Wittenberg, although he never speaks audibly. In the sequel, he's become the main villain, and manages to fool most of the Wasteland citizens into thinking he's changed. For this appearance, he's voiced by Jim Meskimen, and doesn't just get the first true dialogue he's had in a very long time, he also gets several songs along the way. Although we most likely won't be getting any more Epic Mickey games in the future due to the company closing, I'm curious if the Mad Doctor will continue his ungodly experiments. I get the feeling we haven't seen the last of him. The Mad Doctor actually inspired a few other similar characters. The Mickey Mouse newspaper strip by Floyd Gottfredson had a trio of evil scientists named X, Double X, and Triple X, there's that name again, who appeared in a story arc written around the time the original Mad Doctor short premiered. Most likely, the comic was meant to promote the cartoon. This evil trio wanted to hypnotize the world's population into either being their slaves or fighting to the death for their amusement. Mickey, of course, turned their hypno-ray on them and forced them to reform. Mickey would deal with yet another mad scientist later in 1995, when the short Runaway Brain premiered. This cartoon featured Mickey being duped into working as a test subject for the demented Dr. Frank and Ollie, who was named after the animators Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson. Frank and Ollie's fiendish plan was to put Mickey's brain in the body of his enormous monster Julius, presumably named after the cat from the Alice cartoons. Despite Frank and Ollie being well animated and wonderfully voiced by Kelsey Grammer, he met a very quick, untimely end as the result of his experiments, reduced to a pile of ashes. The rest of this cartoon had Mickey fighting Julius. Julius closely resembled Pete, and even had Jim Cummings as his voice actor to further the connection. Julius made a surprise return in Kingdom Hearts 3D Dream Drop Distance as a boss that can be fought after completing the main plotline. Like many bonus bosses in video games, he had no bearing on the plot whatsoever, and just existed as a fun challenge. That about covers it for the classic villains this round. Next time in this series, we're looking at some more vintage baddies before moving on to feature films. I'll see you then.